Hey, good Wednesday evening to you. Justin Oates with the Epora Church of Christ. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. I'm certainly glad to have you with us this evening as we we're so blessed to have the opportunity to continue to study in the book of Malachi. This is our second week to hit the book of Malachi and to get to look at the message really of warning that God has to the, the people there in Jerusalem. It's a powerful book. It's a short book. Um, but it's also a very applicable book, and it's very important for us to understand this as we go throughout the text. So I'm, I'm, I'm certainly glad to have you with us. I think the lesson tonight especially is going to be an eye-opening lesson, uh, and so I'm certainly glad you're here for that. Let's begin this evening with a word of prayer. Our most high and holy God and Father in heaven, hallowed be your most wonderful name. Our Father, we're so blessed in you that we have you as our almighty God, that you Make our pathways straight, Father, that in you we find our blessings, our peace, and our comfort. Father, we pray for those that are studying with us tonight, that you open our hearts and our minds to your message, that we might dedicate our lives to your service, so that when people see us out in the community, they see you through us. Father, I pray that you'd be with those that are sick and suffering, those that are going through different struggles at this time, Father, whether it be uh, mental struggles, relationship struggles, uh, lots of different things that, that people are dealing with right now. I pray, Father, that if it be your will, that you would guide their hearts in doing all things to your glory. Father, we pray that you would forgive us of our many unforgiven sins. Father, we know we fall short of your glory. We're so thankful that we have the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, to cleanse us of our sins, to make us whole, that we are adopted into the family. Guide us throughout this time of studies. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, if you got your Bibles, turn to the book of Malachi, the second chapter. That is where we're going to be this evening. Uh, and again, as I told you, I think you've definitely picked a good study to be a part of this evening because of just how important and how applicable a message like this really is. So I mentioned this to you last week that the book of Malachi is a little bit different than the other post-exilic writings. Uh, if if post-exilic, if you're not familiar with that, that just means post-exile writing. You've got Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, the three post-exilic prophets. And the first two, Haggai and Zechariah, they're, they're encouragers and they're bringing messages of hope to, to really kind of close out the Old Testament. You think, well, man, this is ending on such a good note. And then you get to Malachi and Malachi is a warning, a very staunch. If you want to know how serious of a warning the book of Malachi is, Go ahead and turn to the fourth chapter, the final chapter of this book, and just read those short six verses and see the, the warning given to this. It's a serious book, uh, and that's the difference in this, is that most prophets ended on some level of encouragement. Malachi is not. So in this book of warning, we come to our second chapter, which is broken down into two sections. So typically, we would do a chapter a night. The le these two lessons are so important in chapter two that I'm actually going to break this up over two weeks. The first section that we're going to look at tonight is the unholiness of the priest. That's one through nine. And then next week, if the Lord wills, we're going to look at the unholiness of the people, verses 10 through 16. So you've got unholiness of the priest, unholiness of the people. This is directly applicable in message to us today. Very important for us to understand. And so we're going to take two weeks to really go through this a little more in depth. And, and look, I'm going to try not to preach. I don't want Diane to get riled. I'm, not, I'm going to try not to preach. And I'm picking on Diane, of course. But um, so much of this applies to us. So I make no promises that I won't start preaching. But again, very powerful text. All right, let's begin reading uh, chapter 2. Let's just look at verse 1 real quick. And now, O priest... This commandment is for you. So something to remember. I know we, we're one verse in. It doesn't sound like much is there, but there's something I want you to remember about that statement. And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. That's spoken directly by God. All right, 47 of 55 of these verses that make up the book of Malachi are God speaking. And in chapter two, this tone here is not good. This is not a pleasant tone that God is giving in this statement. In fact, this mirrors very closely the type of tone and the message that you find in the prophets 
Hosea and Amos and Micah who were pre-exilic prophets. But when you found that same tone being mentioned in their prophecies, it was basically saying that you've come to the point that there is no mitigation for the coming judgment upon you. You've come up to the point of no return and you wholeheartedly stepped across it. You went past that point of no return. And so now he says, and now, O priest, is highlighting the shift in focus here. Because to end out the previous chapter in chapter one, the focus uh, of God was upon the indifferent worship of the people and, you, and, and how they were offering to God. You know, if they had an animal that was sick and it was near death, as we'll take it to the temple, we'll offer that to God. Or, you know, uh, you got a, a lamb that gets attacked by a wolf and you get the wolf away from it. And you, you take this bloodied lamb that's near death to the temple. Well, hey, here's my, my sacrifice. Go ahead and offer this. Let's give God the bare minimum we can give God. That's good enough just to give him just the bare minimum, which that shows you the heart of people, that they're not interested in worshiping God. And this is just a short hundred years past the temple being rebuilt, and they're already not interested in worshiping God. But guess who's not innocent in all this? And this is why God's focus shifts here. The priests are just as guilty because they went right along with it. They're the ones who are making the sacrifices. And, and they know when they see this sacrifice that it's not sufficient. It should not have been accepted. It should not have been allowed. And we made this point last week that God cares how we worship. But what the priests were doing is they were just doing the stuff. You know, they were dotting the I's, crossing the T's. They were checking boxes. Saying, yep, I've done this. I've done this. I've done this. And if you remember in the last chapter, God tells them, well, hey, take that animal to your governor and see how that would go over with them because that wouldn't be accepted. And so this verse clearly says, this commandment is for you. Now, that's odd when you read this chapter. And again, I realize we've made it a whopping one verse in, but no commandment is actually given. And so what is that about? And I say no command, there's no thou shalt. It's, it's conditional statements of a warning that's really coming. That This Hebrew phraseology here really means warning. The statement of warning is for you from the very breath of God to the priest. We find their condition. And so I emphasize that point, and I told you in the beginning how applicable this chapter is for us. And while we're breaking it down into two parts, is I want you to understand something in this correlation between God's message to the priest and how we can draw anything from that message. Do you understand that as a Christian, you are God's priest today? So uh, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a priest or a preacher. That's not what I'm talking about. See, 1 Peter 2, 9, it may even be worthwhile to jot that down there in the margins of your Bible. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, but you, speaking to Christians, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, for what? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you. So we are God's priest today. We are God's representatives today representing God to a lost world. You think about Christians and how we think that our purpose and our, our mission, if you will, is to just go to church, to just basically blend in and, and go to church. That's not the case. You are God's priest. That means you have a ministry. And folks, this is something that God takes seriously. You have a ministry. Now, everybody's ministry is different. Not everybody's ministry is getting behind a pulpit. Everybody's ministry is different, but you have something because as a Christian, you are God's priest. But to the literal priest in Jerusalem, um, this message is coming to them of warning because they didn't take worshiping God seriously, which is a warning that comes to us as well. So listen to what verse two says. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I've cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. So notice this, and this is important in verse two, that both the promises of blessing and the promises of cursings are conditional. 
Did you, did you catch that? The faithful will be blessed if they are repentant and if they turn to God. The unfaithful will be cursed if they choose not to hear God's word and not to obey them. And, and so we find within this, this, this message of what God is saying about their, their coming to this point of no return and you've got to decide, are you going to be obedient to God or, or to self? And these priests, have, their hearts have gotten so hardened to God's word that they're not doing and not interested in doing what God says. And so the new King, uh, I'm reading from the New King James. The King James hits the mark a little bit better on this passage because it includes the article the, T-H-E, the curse. Because in the Bible, when you read through the Old Testament, especially the book of Deuteronomy, you're going to find that the curse has already been given to Israel from the beginning of their history if they fail to keep God's commandment. It was always conditional. And so jot down Deuteronomy 28, verses 16 through 19. Deuteronomy 28, verses 16 through 19. I want to read this passage for you. Beginning in verse 16 of Deuteronomy 28. Cursed shall thou be in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy kneading trough. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the fruit of the ground, the increase of the cattle and the young of the flock. Cursed shall be thou when thou comest in, and cursed shall be thou when thou goest out. So this cursing, or the article, the curse, isn't just a single point like, hey, listen, if you don't obey God, you're just going to have a bad, you're going to kick, your, your pinky toe is going to hit the side of the bed. No, when God describes these cursings, it is a removal of all the blessings that God has bestowed upon them. And we've seen this already, have we not? God allowed their ancestors, both in the north and the south, to live and enjoy old age. No, they were hauled off into captivity. So they should have learned this lesson already. The, the northern Israel never came back. Judah came back because they have a purpose. But notice the end of this verse because it's important. There, he's, he, God's kind of laying out the conditions. If you do this, if you do that, if you don't listen, if you don't obey, then you're going to be cursed. But at the end of the verse, he says, yes, I have cursed you already. And the literal Hebrew text there says, I have cursed every one of your blessings. You say, well, that's not very nice. Why would he do that? Well, because he says, you didn't listen. You were warned over and over and over again, and you didn't listen. You didn't keep the commandments of God who freed you from captivity, just like Egypt, just like what happened with Babylon and Persia, just like us today being freed from the captivity of our sins. That should have an impact on your heart that says, okay, I'm going to be obedient to God. But the priesthood wasn't interested in that. And so now, because of that, I'm going to go ahead and warn you, verse 3 gets very graphic, uh, very graphic. Verse 3 says, Behold, because you didn't do all these things, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces, the refuse of your solemn feast, and one will take you away with it. Now, you're like, well, that doesn't seem very graphic. Now, this is extremely graphic language in detail of how God is going to view these priests at this time. Now, again, New King James says refuse. Your translation could say awful, O-F-F-A-L, awful, which we find in other translations. And what that is, why I say this is graphic, that is the, the waste and the entrails of an animal that was coming to be offered as a sacrifice those would be removed from the animal because they're nasty, they're filthy, they're unclean. They cannot be part of the worship, so they have to be removed before the animal goes upon the altar. And someone would haul away those entrails to outside the city, and they would burn them in a dump area. That's what this is describing. And so God is saying to these priests, because of, of how faithless you've become in your worship and how disobedient, how you allow tainted sacrifices upon the altar, that you're in danger of being considered refuse. And this refuse is to be done with nothing other than having someone come and haul it outside the city to burn it as waste. 
And that's how God is viewing them as a nasty, disgusting, vile, waste byproduct. And you think God doesn't take this seriously? And in fact, we know this is going to happen, don't we? We have the full revelation of God, but on top of that, we have history to go back and look upon because let's think about the priesthood and let's think about what events have taken place in Jerusalem. Well, let's see if we back up to AD 70, what took place. Well, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was completely demolished. Not one stone left upon another, which is what the Bible told us. And the priests were removed, destroyed, and lineages destroyed to the fact that no priest can track their genealogy back to Levi. It was completely destroyed. These priests today came up on the point of no return and said, we're still not going to listen. We're going to just keep doing our own thing. It will be good enough. And God says, that's not the case. Your, your idea of good enough, if it doesn't match what the Bible says about it, isn't going to be acceptable. And so then he says in verse four that this warning of they're going to be refuse and they're going to be thrown out of the city if they don't listen. He says, then when that happens, you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. Again, this commandment is that same phraseology there for this warning, the statement of warning. And so we get this description of Levi, that my covenant with Levi may continue. Well, Levi, of course, is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And Levi is the one to whom the priest would come. That's where you get the Levitical tribe or the priestly tribe. That was the covenant that was made, that the Levites were the ones that would be in the temple. They were the ones that would be overseeing all of the sacrifices. And that's the comparison. He says, listen, you didn't heed my warnings. You're going to be refuse. He says, but here was my covenant with Levi. And that covenant had blessings associated with it and all these things. And so the question is, what was the goal of these warnings? Why would God give these warnings to these people? Well, it's, it's straightforward, so that they would repent, that they would open their hearts to God, that this covenant would continue, even if that meant these wicked priests would be like refuse and be thrown out of the city. Then the covenant with Levi would continue. And you remember in chapter one, we kind of highlighted this last week, that God said, who would shut the doors of the temple? Meaning that the doors of the temple needed to be shut because God wasn't accepting their offerings. So the hope is that the faithful would get back to work once you got the evil out of the way to, to bring them back. This is a message of correction. And you think about it, he says, then you're going to know that this is from me. Now, if you have children and you've had to discipline your children, I've got two stubborn headed boys. So I have to discipline mine quite often. And uh, we ask them the question, now, do you understand why you're in trouble? Do you understand why this happened? Well, that's what God is doing. Because the, the Jews, you remember God's addressing all of these questions that the Jews are claiming in their hearts to the point that they're even saying, well, God doesn't even really love me because God says, well, I've loved you. And they said, well, when have you shown you've loved me? All these different things. And so what God is telling them is that this is all for your good. You just, you don't see it yet. But you, you have to understand that's the nature of man. We don't like correction. Even though it's desperately, it's desperately, desperately needed at times. What we want instead is the blessing from God upon how we live with failure to see that God will not bless sin and faithlessness. He won't do it. And so instead, what he's going to show is the example looking again back at Levi. He says, now listen, you are the priest. This is what you should look like. And I want you to hear that because I told you, you are God's priest today. So you are found within these passages as well. So we're going to see these examples again, looking at Levi, verse five. My covenant was with him, one of life, and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. Now, it's, it's interesting that this verse, if, if you look at it, it speaks of the covenant with Levi in the past tense. Like God has already made the point very clear that you're not going to heed my warnings. 
that the sinful priests are going to be broken off from the covenant of God. God's covenant with man, God's covenant with priests are conditional. You're not meeting up your end of the deal, so the covenant is not going to continue. And that's why you said, if you were here, if you will obey, if you do these things, then the covenant will continue. But we go back to the very beginning of the covenant with Levi, which we're talking about Levi as if we're talking about a singular person, when really we're talking about the priest of Levi, which is centered in the very first priest that we have. Now, do you remember who the first Levitical priest was? I should have put a poll question up so you could answer the question. It was Aaron, the brother of Moses. Now, Aaron was in no way perfect. Uh, but this idea of the early priests are going to be really elevated in their faithfulness. He wasn't perfect. We, we know Aaron was in no way perfect. Because you remember, they, they made the golden calves while Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments. But he feared God. He respected God. He wasn't perfect. We only have one perfect high priest. That is Jesus Christ in heaven. But Aaron feared God. The, the priest did. And so what God is doing is teaching us all very important lessons in these passages. He's laying out some extremely important points of what his priest looked like then. And if you're going to be a priest today of God, what it looks like for you. And so he says, first off, he lays out a few points for us. Really, it's a great sermon outline. Uh, but first off, if you're going to be God's priest, according to this verse, you have to fear and respect God. You know, There's a reason we don't take our worship lightly. There's a reason why we don't call God daddy. That, that, that drives me crazy when I hear someone that professes to be a Christian, they'll pray to daddy. He is God almighty. He is the alpha, the omega. He's the creator. He is the sustainer. So we start our journey as faithful Christians, if nothing else, because we're still learning, we're babes in Christ, but we've understood that we need to show reverence to God just as the original priest did. Let that be what people see when they see you in this world, they say, well, there's, there's something different about him. He, he stands out in the crowd and he, he's talking about God. He's trying to bring honor to God. So he says it has to start with fear and respect, but, that, but that's not it. He keeps on going. Verse six, the law of truth was in his mouth and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. So all of these priests that are being so elevated, they, they talk about their thoughts and their feelings. Is that what it says? That their personal feelings about everything were on the forefront of their mouth? No, it says the law of truth, which is the word of God, was in their mouth. And what that means, so if, if first off, you've got to fear and respect, which means reverence is what that means. That word for fear just means reverence. It's not like you're shaking in your boots, scared of the boogeyman. You're showing respect and reverence to God. Well, then he says, if you're gonna be God's priest, you have to rightly know how to divide the word of God to understand and comprehend true knowledge. And that word is what they spoke, that word is what was on their hearts. And it says they help people turn people from iniquity. But but how do they do that? How can we as God's priests today turn people from iniquity? Well, they pointed people to the true worship of God. That's our goal today is to point people towards the Savior, which is our calling and our commission. That should be every one of our goal. Because listen, and this is kind of tough. Believe it or not, this is tough for some people to hear. You can't save anybody. You cannot save a single person's soul. All you can do is point them to the Savior. Jesus saves. We're his messengers. That's what we're doing. We're, we are spreading the, the word about our Lord and Savior. We can't do that. But what, was, what were the words of these, these priests in Jerusalem? Kind of as the comparison of the Levitical priest. Well, what they're, what they're showing in action and what they're basically saying is, well, God doesn't really care how you worship or else they wouldn't have allowed what they allowed upon the altar. Also, that showing fear and reverence to God, well, that's not really that important either when these matter a whole lot. What we say matters. That, that's kind of the important topic here. 
If I was going to highlight this verse, that's, that's what I would say. What we say matters. I'm going to give you an example. And this is a bit of a pet peeve. I've got uh, friends that I've had this conversation with, and they're, and they're Christians. But we were talking about life and death and, and probably deeper conversations that, that we needed to have just over a cup of coffee. But making comments in a, in a large group of people, of which are full of non-Christians also, talking about how terrified they are of death. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't know of many people that are out looking to die, but for a Christian, that's our homecoming. That's when we get to go home. But these, these non-Christians were hearing us as Christians say, well, I'm terrified of death. Well, so are they. But that goes for how we speak about life, about marriage, about God's, God's plan for marriage, about raising kids, about the family. So, I mean, just all these different topics. And when these conversations come up, how will people hear you speak on these things? These faithful priests, in comparison, had the word of God on their mouth. So when they hear you speak, is it with worldly understanding and worldly opinions, because everybody has an opinion, or, and this is important, are God's words what's on your mouth? Levi spoke the truth, faithful instruction in his mouth, pointed to God with his actions, with his speech, everything, so that if they rejected him, they weren't rejecting his opinion, they were rejecting God's truth. It's important for us to understand what we say matters. But notice verse 8, but, there's our conjunction statement, but you have departed from the way. Again, talking to these priests, you've departed from the way, you have caused many to stumble at the law, you have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. The final thing, if you are God's priest, it should, your life should never cause someone to stumble in their faith. You should never be guilty of doing something or giving the impression that God Almighty is okay with something that is a sin. That's why it's important for us to call things sinful if they're sinful. Because you, you live that example and they see that and go, well, that, he's a Christian, that must be okay. These priests were allowing abominable sacrifices as if God didn't care when they should have turned them away and said, this matters to God, get your mind right, get your respect where it should be for the reverence of God, but they didn't do it. Nor are they gonna listen to any of these warnings by God because this verse declares that they flagrantly violated the covenant of God and in doing so, they forfeited their covenant as God's priest. And so verse nine, the final verse of this study. Therefore, because of all of that, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people because you have not kept my ways but shown partiality in the law. So you didn't listen. This is what's happened. That's why it starts off with therefore. Therefore, because you wouldn't listen, you didn't do, I'm gonna make you contemptible before all the people. There are consequences for your actions. Since you've shown contempt for God, I'm going to make you contemptible. Since you've shown such low regard for God, I'm going to make you low in the esteem of people. So what God's done in this passage is he's kind of made us a checklist of what a faithful priest looks like. And remember, if you're a Christian, you are God's priest today. You are his royal priesthood. And so he gives us this list. He lays out eight points. He says, first off, talking of Levi, the, this description of faithful priesthood, he says, he feared me. He acted as in the presence of a just and holy God. The law of God was on his mouth. By example and teaching, he influenced others. No iniquity proceeded from his lips. He lived in such a manner as to restrict, uh, retain his union with God. He turned people away from iniquity and he conducted himself like a true messenger of God. That's what the priesthood of God looks like. But what these unfaithful priests has, had done, and what we have to be careful as priests today not to do, is they went by and they checked off every single box saying, nope, not doing that. Nope, not gonna do that. Yep, I'm guilty of this. They did the exact opposite of what God told them that they should be doing. And so I emphasize this, and I want to break this section out because one, I want you to understand that you are God's priest today. 
So a warning given to God's priest about unfaithful worship and unfaithful living and unfaithful dealings with people applies to you. We're not under the old covenant, but you are God's priest. And this goes to show you that God cares about how we worship and about what our ministry is. And so you also have to remember the second point. If God cares about this and you are God's priest, you have to understand something. The world is always watching, especially if they know that you are a Christian. They're going to start watching you a little bit closer. And so you're either an example for God or your actions and your speech go against God, like these priests had become. And what the people are looking for are inconsistencies in your faith. You say, well, you say this, but you do that. Well, then they would have every right to call you a hypocrite because that is what a hypocrite would do. And they're looking for these things. And I go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, that says, but as he who called you as holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. See, that's our calling as the priesthood today is to be holy, is to show reverence to God, show fear, speak his truth, to help people turn from iniquity, never to be a stumbling block for anyone else. Like these priests had become, they were unfaithful priests. But what we're gonna see in our study next week is it's not just about the unfaithful priests, but the unfaithful people. So it continues to go down from there. So that is our lesson for this Wednesday evening, looking at the priesthood. I hope uh, this lesson maybe opened your eyes to a couple of things. If you have any thoughts, any questions, any comments, please reach out to me and let me know. Put the comments on here. Uh, I would certainly be glad to see what you thought and if you have any questions. Uh, and as always, I would love to study with you if you would like to go uh, more in depth into what took place in Jerusalem or what that means for us today. I thank you all once again for being with me on this Wednesday evening. I want to encourage you to remember our services coming up this Sunday at Eupora Bible study at 930. We're going through the Gospel of Mark, which is a great study. We have our worship, uh, worship hour at 1030, and then we're going to have a fellowship meal. If you like to eat, I would encourage you to be there this Sunday because we've got some of the best cooks in the entire world and there are more food to go around than we'll eat. So that's this Sunday, 1030, for our worship service. Then following the fellowship meal, we'll come right back in for another evening or another afternoon service. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you all then. Make sure you reach out, you invite somebody so that we will have a fantastic weekend, and I can't wait for it. Thank you all once again for being with me. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your week. Bye, everybody.